Welcome to part two in our biochemical energy generation and utilization section. In this section, we will discuss the role of ATP in processes that require cellular movement. In the previous section, we have seen that neurons use a lot of energy to generate the movement of ions across the membrane against their concentration gradient. Neurons and other cell types also have energy demands to move molecules from one cellular location to another. Within neurons, this can be especially energy intensive due to the potential length of the neuron. Imagine having to move neurotransmitters made in the soma at the base of the spine all the way to the axon terminal at the big toe. That's a long way for a very small molecule to move. Neurons are specialized cells with a complex architecture that includes elaborate dendritic branches and a long narrow axon that extends from the cell body to the axon terminal. The organized transport of essential biological materials throughout the neuron is required to support its growth, function, and viability. Simplistically, the axonal transport system comprises cargo, motor proteins that power cargo transport, cytoskeletal filaments or tracks along which the motors generate force and movement, and linker proteins that attach the motor proteins to cargo or other cellular structures, and any accessory molecules that initiate and regulate transport. Long distance transport in the axon is primarily a microtubule dependent process. The microtubule tracks within an axon possess inherent polarity and are uniformly oriented with the fast growing plus ends projecting towards the synapse and the slow growing minus ends towards the cell body. The motor proteins that power axonal transport on the microtubules are members of the kinesin and the dynein superfamilies. Kinesins are generally plus end directed motor proteins that transport cargo such as synaptic vesicle precursors and membranous organelles anterogradely toward the synapse. Cytoplasmic dynenes are minus end directed motor proteins that transport cargos including neurotrophic signals, endosomes, and other organelles and vesicles retrogradely towards the cell body. This slide shows the kinesin dimer, shown in red, attached to the microtubule, shown in blue. The motility of the kinesin motor along the microtubule uses a rotational process that is ATP dependent. Each portion of the kinesin dimer that contacts the microtubule is shown above in blue for one dimer and green for the other dimer. When the kinesin binding domain is attached to the microtubule, a molecule of ATP can associate with it, causing the protein to rotate or swivel towards the plus end of the microtubule. Following the rotation, the molecule of ADP that's attached to the other part of the dimer is dissociated. The ADP that is attached to the other dimer binding site is released from the kinesin. This allows the second microtubule binding site to attach to the microtubule. Double binding to the microtubule causes the hydrolysis of the ATP molecule bound to the downstream kinesin binding domain. ATP hydrolysis causes the release of that binding domain from the microtubule, completing one round of movement. ATP can then associate with the kinesin binding domain that is still attached to the microtubule. In this fashion, the kinesin walks down the microtubule towards the axon terminal. In addition to the transport of molecules throughout the cell, NTP energy is required for the assembly of many cellular structures. A good example is one that you've seen from last term, the ribosome. Assembly of the ribosome begins with the association of the messenger RNA with the small subunit the 30th subunit of the ribosome. This process is aided by the association of initiation factors 1 and 3, IF1 and IF3. Initiation factor 2, IF2, 
chaperones the transport of the methionine-containing tRNA to the start codon position of the messenger RNA. This allows the docking of the large subunit of the ribosome and cleavage of the GTP that is bound to the IF2 protein. Cleavage of GTP to GDP allows the release of the initiation factors and full assembly of the complete ribosome structure. If you recall, the elongation phase of protein synthesis was also energy intensive. NTP energy is also required for the gross motor movements that we can consciously mediate through muscle contraction. Skeletal muscles are composed of tubular muscle cells. Muscle cells are called myocytes, muscle fibers, or myofibers, and are formed in a process known as myogenesis. The slide above is a longitudinal section of skeletal muscle. As cells go, myocytes, well, they're weird. These cells are actually many cells that have merged together to form a long myofiber complex. In the slide section above, less than 20 myocytes are shown, and none of them are complete cells. They continue off the slide section in both directions. They have multiple nuclei associated with them that are stained in dark purple. They are typically squished to the sides of the tube. A single myocyte or myofiber may have over 100 nuclei. Each myocyte contains numerous tubular myofibrils or tube-like bundles of fiber proteins. Each myocyte contains tubular myofibrils or tube-like bundles of fiber protein. The top diagram shows a cross-sectional view of a single muscle cell with its many myofibrils. In between the myofibrils, you may also notice that the muscle cell also contain numerous mitochondria powering the energy demand of the tissue. The lower diagram shows a longitudinal section of one of the myofibrils. Myofibrils are composed of repeating sections called sarcomeres, which appear under a microscope as alternating dark and light bands. This will be shown on the next slide. Also surrounding each myofibril is a lattice network of a specialized organelle called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, shown in yellow above. One of the main functions of the sarcoplasmic reticulum is to sequester calcium that will be transiently released into the myofibril during the firing and contraction of the muscle fiber. Here is a microscopic view of a sarcomere from a striated myofibril. The sarcomere unit is defined as the region between the two Z lines. Sarcomeres are composed of long fibrous proteins as filaments that slide past each other when a muscle contracts or relaxes. Two of the important proteins are myosin, which form the thick filaments, and actin, which form the thin filaments. The actin filaments, shown in blue above, are covalently bound to the macromolecules found at the Z-line, which is actually a dense disk of proteins and carbohydrates. The myosin, or thick filament shown in orange above, can attach to the actin filaments and pull them into a contracted state. This diagram gives an overview about how muscle contraction is initiated. To begin, the muscle cells are stimulated by neuronal signals. An action potential arrives at a neuromuscular juncture. Acetylcholine neurotransmitters, ACH, are released and bind with receptors on the myocytes. A G-protein cascade is initiated that results in the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium that is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum is required to initiate muscle contraction. Calcium binds to a protein associated with the actin filament called troponin. Troponin forms a complex with a fibrous protein called tropomyosin that wraps around the actin filament. The troponin is shown in yellow above and the tropomyosin in orange. Upon calcium binding, the troponin protein changes shape 
and moves the tropomyosin filament, uncovering a binding site on the actin filament for the myosin head group of the thick filament, shown in purple. The myosin head group is bound with a molecule of ADP and inorganic phosphate, or a hydrolyzed ATP molecule. To release the ADP and PI, the myosin head group must bind with the actin filament. Binding of the actin filament causes the myosin, ADP, and PI complex to shift conformation, causing the power stroke that draws the actin filaments in towards the center of the sarcomere structure and causes muscle contraction. During this time, all of the myocytes within the muscle fiber become activated at the same time, and the muscle shortens to the contracted state. Back at the microscopic level, following the power stroke of the myosin head group, it releases the ADP and PI molecule. The release of the ADP and PI by myosin opens up the binding site for ATP. As ATP enters the binding site, it disrupts the myosin cross bridge with the actin filament, and muscle contraction is released. Without the binding of a new ATP molecule, the muscle would be stuck in the contracted state. This is seen after death, when the muscles of the body go into a stiffened state called rigor mortis. This is due to the depletion of cellular ATP within the system. Hydrolysis of the ATP to ADP and PI causes the myosin head group to shift back into the pre-contracted state, and it's now loaded for another round of muscle contraction. If the neuronal signal for muscle contraction stops and calcium levels in the cytoplasm drop, the troponin and tropomyosin complex will again block the myosin binding site on the actin filament, and muscle contraction will not occur. Overall, in this section, you have seen many examples of how NTPs are utilized during cellular movement processes.